And so I've been on this topic for a while, those who are fans. If anybody missed the double edition, the January, Febru February double edition of the Economic Diplomacy Works, Sean Dorman, the editor of the Foreign Service Journal, is holding up in, in the back. You're welcome to take a copy with you. We ask all of you to contribute your stories of how economic diplomacy works. We really want to do a focus on this. Um, we hosted a discussion here in January with Ambassadors uh, Stuart Jones and John Byerly and Virginia Bennett about economic diplomacy and diplomats, um, how we work in the Foreign Service to make it possible for American companies to compete and win and keep us prosperous here at home. We've been focusing on that metaphor of the baseball game where um, perhaps China and Laird may say others are yeah. waiting in the wings are at bat and the Foreign Service team is missing the player on second base and shortstop. And it doesn't look good as China keeps cracking them right down that hole in the field and running the bases. And so part of what we've been saying is get somebody back on second base and shortstop, properly staff these embassies. So we're still working on that. The 19 appropriation put in $84 million on the overseas uh, programs line item. That is enough to cover the overseas support cost of putting 280 mid-level officers in the field. That would not quite double the number of straight econ <coughs> officers state has in the field now. 369 straight econ positions is all that's left after rounds of the Iraq tax. Once we get that team in the field, though, they need tools. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We have got a new tool, one of the most exciting tools to come around in a while. It's the BUILD Act. And the BUILD Act really does help us level the playing field and make it possible for American companies to get right back in the game. So that's our topic today. And we are going to do this in at least two rounds and then open it up to you for questions. I'm going to start off with Congressman Yoho, as you would expect. As I've said, we are so pleased to have him <coughs> here. He and his um, chief of staff, James Walsh, where's Jimmy? <laughs> Is Jimmy back there taking pictures? Um, were uh, key architects of the Build Act. And it's a, it's a really powerful story that Congressman Yoho tells. It's bookmarked in your Foreign Service Journal. You um, came to town I from did. our native Gainesville. That's right. Uh, <laughs> not a fan of foreign assistance and wondering why we spent all this money overseas. <laughs> And you've changed your mind, and we would love to hear you talk about what made you change your mind. I didn't know you were going to out me that bad, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess everybody knows that. Is this too loud? Anyways, I think everybody's happy now. I've got to start this off with um, uh, Ambassador Stevens. Uh, we found out was a gator. Not only I told her I was a double gator, and I was proud of that. She goes, "I'm a triple gator." <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do gator chomp. And Kim, where's Kim? <laughs> there we go, ready? She's a gator. Is anybody else here a gator? Thank All right. You. The rest of you, I, I feel bad for you. You can be. <laughs> ready? <laughs> That's the gator Sorry. <laughs> We're in a rebuilding year. <laughs> I think most of you guys know my story. I'm a veterinarian, and I came to Washington angry. Uh, I wanted to get rid of foreign aid. And what I learned real quickly <coughs> is, and I tell this story, I told this in front of Nita Lowy and Hal Rogers, and they were, like, petrified that I was at a, an appropriations uh, hearing. And uh, they were like, oh, my God, this guy, I know he's going to be a disaster. And uh, I told them the story, and my goal was to move countries from aid to trade as quick as we can because you become more learned once you get up here in the process. And so what we found, and, and it was neat, after that meeting, Nita Lowy goes, that was so eloquently said. And I've never had anybody describe my speaking abilities that way, so uh, I must have hit a good mark with her. What we had heard over and over again after I got up here is that our foreign uh, ability to go into another country was hamstrung. You know, it was outdated. Uh, we learned about OPIC. I learned about that, I think, in one of our first or second foreign affairs hearing uh, from Elizabeth Littlefield when she was in charge of that. And we were blown away about a model in government that could lend money out or invest money and have a return in a positive way. You know, right now it's 41 out of 40 years or 42 out of 41 years that are 41 years out of 42 years that had a positive return. And I'm like, why can't we duplicate that and make it better? And then we started to hear, and I love this right here, Tales from the Field. This is so important to hear from <coughs> you guys. We're hearing uh, anecdotally and secondhand that people in the State Department were just kind of frustrated because OPEC 
as good as it had been when it was created, had become like a 1970s car in, in today's date, 2019. It still did what it had to do, but it was very basic compared to today. And so what happened is OPEC wasn't at the table, and we found out it wasn't being invited to the table because it was so cumbersome compared to what the, the development DFIs from other countries like JPEG, <coughs> Canada, the UK, and uh, elsewhere. And then I was hearing stories, uh, like I said, anecdotally and secondhand, um, where people were telling from our State Department, were telling people, don't even bother with the United States government, go to China, go to here. That can't happen. And so what can we do, and how can we make this better? And then we went to work on the, on the Build Act, and uh, James Walsh, he did the yeoman's work on this. A lot of you probably have crossed paths with him. And um, it became a bipartisan, bicameral, and the president was behind it. And I think this is the way Congress is supposed to work. And then the other thing that we really wanted to emphasize was how do we compete with China on their Belt Road Initiative, which I feel was predatory lending or the robber barons of the 1800s. And uh, it left countries in a worse way, and it benefited China so strongly, whether it's their workers or materials and all that. And they were taking over strategic point, uh, ports and you know strategic assets, I'll say, of countries. And so I wanted a way that we could counter that in a positive way so that we can create these countries, move them from aid to trade. And if you do that, you're developing an economy via infrastructures and those basic things that somebody needs in their country to be able to develop a market from that market develops an economy, and if we're strong trading partners, what I personally feel that there'll be less conflicts in the, in the world. And I sit on foreign affairs, as you guys know. I feel foreign affairs is the most important uh, department we have or agency in government, because if you have strong foreign policy, good foreign policy, you have good economic policy, you have good trade policies, and I think more importantly, you, more importantly, you have strong national security. And so that's our goal so that we can leave, I don't want to say a legacy, but a brighter future for our country and hopefully less conflicts. And with that, um, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Or that was an inspiring vision. That was great. I'm going to spend a moment coming off that high moment to where we are now and just to paint the picture of rising great power competition. A quick anecdote sharing from Stu Jones on this panel in January. He's now with, uh, he was former ambassador to Jordan and Iraq. Some of you know him. He was our acting assistant secretary for the Near East Asia, Near NEA Bureau. He's now a top executive with Bechtel. He talked about now he reads Engineering Digest, which does an annual survey of the top construction and engineering companies in the world. And he said in 2008, he checked the list, and there wasn't a single Chinese firm in the top 10. He checked it again when it came out in 2018, and eight of the top 10 slots were occupied by China, and Bechtel, which had always been in the top 10, had fallen out to number 12. This is what rising great power competition looks like. I've been at this for a while. We haven't done rising power, comp we have not done great power competition for most of our careers. This is what the new national security strategy says. It's not just mm -hmm. the ongoing transnational threats. There's a new threat that we need to be prepared for. And that's the pivot we're talking about, and this is what the Build Act helped us with. Um, I will just tell you, Congressman Yoho's colleague in the House, Congressman McCall, who's the ranking Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, tells a story about uh, six or eight African ambassadors posted here in Washington coming to see him. And they said, we're coming to see you because we would really rather do business with America but we mm -hmm. can't find any Americans to work with. Can you please help us? Please let us do business with you. So this is not a kind of an imperial imposition proposition. We hear this all the time. We would rather do business with, with America. I see all kinds of reasons why they'd want to do that, but I wanted to get that out there. I'm going to turn to Dan Crocker now. The, um, he's AFSA's vice president for the Foreign Commercial Service, and he was also my commercial attache in Panama mm -hmm. when um, I was ambassador there. And we faced some uphill battles, really, <laughs> with um, an unclean trout stream, to use another one of the <laughs> metaphors that has emerged. Um, Dan's column is, you've got an advanced mm -hmm. copy there on your, um, on your papers. But Dan, can you talk to us about what does it look like out in the field? How, how's the home team, Team USA, doing? Well, Barbara, that's an excellent question. <coughs> I, I think we could fill up an entire session talking about Panama as a case study and 
how we can lose and then eventually win, uh, uh, not using uh, Chinese as a, as a sort of a competitive threat, but instead Brazil. Uh, with Odebrecht and Bandeasi, which is the National Development Bank that, uh, that the government of Brazil used mm -hmm. to advance Odebrecht, which is being unwound in Latin America. But specifically in Africa, it's, it's really, it's, an, it's, a, it's a remarkable story. Uh, just last September alone, in one, this, this one month, uh, China announced $60 billion worth of uh, projects, mainly in infrastructure, just in the region of Africa. Mm -hmm. it, China is already the largest creditor in Latin America, with $150 billion of projects outstanding. A lot of them in spaces where U.S. companies are very competitive and design, build, operate for hydroelectric, for instance. So it's, it's really remarkable what's going on, not only in Africa, but Latin America. But coming back to Africa, the asymmetry is striking. Were we, the commercial service, we only have about 230 officers worldwide and 76 posts. In Africa, we're in only 11 out of 54 countries. And we're actually looking, because of a drawdown and in increase in our operating expenses, in closing some of those posts in the coming year, which is, which is remarkable retreat from the field, as Barbara put it, and is sending a signal as a result to U.S. companies that we're not there to support them physically and sending a signal to the host country governments that we don't care about competition from great powers like China. So this is a real problem. And what we're understanding is that uh, Chinese diplomats, commercial diplomats, focused on Chinese wins outnumber us by 9 or 10 to 1 in most of these African countries. So this is a real challenge that we're facing. The bottom line is this. When we look at the ethos and the culture of the Foreign Commercial Service, which again has 76, is 76 countries, we're all about helping U.S. companies win. We like winning. That's our entire mission. It's narrow. It's deep. It focuses on just helping U.S. companies win. And sometimes we just say as a bumper sticker, uh, we help, we, we help uh, U.S. companies make money. And people are startled at that. It's like uh, diplomats or, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. That's what we know how to do when we document it. Uh, in Representative Yoho's uh, district alone, we helped 80 companies employing over 3,800 men and women. In his district alone, we have that data. We know that we're helping those companies create and retain jobs that are based on exports, trade, and investment. So we know how to do this work. It's simply that by not having the boots on the ground, the field forward force that we need to help U.S. companies be successful, we're sending a very strong signal and we're certainly losing. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I want to turn to Laird, who is, Laird Treber is um, a, an economic cone foreign service officer. He's currently on detail as a senior advisor to the president of the Corporate Council <coughs> on Africa. Previously, Lord was, uh, Laird was uh, economic minister counselor in some of our biggest embassies, our embassy in South, um, South Africa, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. Um, we work together mm -hmm. on, on Iraq, uh, so we, we have... Uh, we have stories to tell from those days. Laird, you've looked at Africa and especially the potential market for U.S. consumer goods. What are the problems facing Team USA in Africa, and why does it matter whether we're in Africa? Uh, Barbara, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here today, and thank you for that great question. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Dan made some great points. I, I uh, will build on those without trying to be apocalyptic. Uh, but because uh, it's it is uh, the importance uh, of kind of what's out there is really uh, stunning. So at least um, from my perch, in terms of trying to promote more U.S. trade and investment uh, between U.S. and African companies, uh, if you just look at the basic numbers. Uh, so an econ officer, we tend to do that nerdy thing. If you look at the the U.N. population projections out through 2050, two thirds of the planet's net addition uh, in terms of humans will come. Mm -hmm. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. In case you're wondering, the other much of the rest of the uh, remainder comes from Bangladesh and India. Uh, so basically, it's not coming from the Northern Hemisphere. If you look at where are not just U.S. companies, but U.S. companies' allies, and that's to say their Japanese or Korean partners, uh, the European partners, most of, most of us are all focused, uh, we're kind of long on that Northern Hemisphere. So if you look at it, so all these new people, uh, that is both a challenge and an opportunity. I think certainly strategically, I would argue that it's very much in the United States' interest that as many African countries as possible find their own solutions to a set of really tough challenges that will frankly be unique challenges. Things like managing, if you thought managing Cairo was tough, you know, managing Lagos in five or <coughs> ten years will be even tougher, et cetera. The, the basic point about this isn't just to look at the challenges. This is also going to drive huge changes in how markets work. Uh, it will change uh, how, basically it will change where consumers are, it will change where workers are, mm -hmm. 
uh, it'll necessarily change a lot of uh, today's kind of existing, you know, corporate link-ups, uh, patterns, things like that. Uh, and so basically, if you're either in a company counting on selling something to a consumer, and that's not just toothpaste, that's cell phones, that's cars, that's computers, uh, our entire knowledge economy, you know, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, uh, you need to have uh, at least to start thinking about mm -hmm. what is your Africa story, uh, understanding that Africa is not one country, it's a series of countries, et cetera. Uh, there is a cost to uh, U.S. companies not having thought through this, uh, and I will. So there's maybe 2,000 or so U.S. companies uh, scattered across Africa. Some are doing some amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, I guess the the part that that is so bittersweet is a lot of U.S. companies are actually doing the right things in the key sectors that Africa needs to really generate the jobs and growth for its own future prosperity. But there are so few U.S. companies that are there that, frankly, in a lot of cases, the pace of these market developments, how they get shaped in terms of standards, uh, in terms of commercial relationships, in terms of the legal arrangements, whatever else, a lot of that is being done by our competitors. Uh, and it's primarily Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, it is absolutely our Korean and Japanese uh, competitors. It is certainly the Chinese. Um, to add one thing to Ambassador Jones' uh, example, I suspect uh, the other two out of those top ten uh, engineering companies were probably mm -hmm. Turkish. And so for every one of these areas where there is a set of challenges, for instance, there are also some opportunities. Uh, and this is, we'll get to this, I think, a little later in the discussion, but for instance, the Turkish companies uh, do extremely well at entering a market, but they often lack the long-term sustainability uh, to maintain a presence in a market. And so they look for a partnership. And so there is a screaming opportunity for U.S. companies uh, if they, frankly, will, will take the time uh, to come and look at, the at what's actually out in Africa. We get, uh, every single day of the week, we get African ambassadors and or companies mm -hmm. uh, that come in and make the point to us of, uh, do you have somebody that can build this road, bring this, this phone <coughs> system, build this hospital, whatever it might be? Uh, and it is painful uh, for us to try and, and do our best to get as many companies to respond uh, but frankly, the, the bench mm -hmm. isn't as deep as it needs to be. Uh, and this is something where uh, the – so step one is getting more companies on the bench, but step two is also once you get a company to, to basically sign up and go to Nigeria or go to South Africa to look at some of the opportunities, then they face a series of other challenges where they really do need to compete on cost. Uh, big parts of those costs are things like market access that we've talked about a little bit, mm -hmm. but also on things like financing. Uh, and this is one where uh, it's, uh, it's even more disappointing to find a U.S. company that goes, uh, makes a really strong bid, uh, but in the end can't bring it home, can't bring the contract home because uh, the tools they need aren't there. So I feel like that's a great time in the conversation to switch from description of the problem to description of the solution. But Carl, I want to get your voice in here. Um, uh, Carl Fickenscher is USAID's Deputy Assistant Administrator for Economic Growth education and environment, and he's a member of the interagency group that's working on implementing the BUILD Act and creating the new U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. Carl, I want you're going to be one of our experts on the solution set here, but can I just get you to do a minute on the problem as you see it? Sure. Thank you for letting me join the, the panel. Um, it's always a danger to be last because I have to avoid being redundant. Um, <laughs> The, the, the congressman and others have, have pointed to some of the, uh, the problems. Um, there is a perception by American businesses that Africa is too difficult, that the, the developing countries are too difficult, that it's given over to China. There are correct perceptions that Team USA is not fu functioning fully. Um, it was described in the early days when we were talking about what do we do to address this problem. Well, we need to cooperate more. And someone said, well, why aren't we cooperating now? We have all of these development tools. We had OPEC, which was, as the congressman said, you know, state of the art in its day as a development finance institution. But over the decades since it was created, our like-minded partners, development partners, came up and, and had better tools, new tools. Um, they, unlike OPEC, had um, equity authority. Uh, we were s stuck with only senior debt, et cetera. We had restrictions um, that didn't make that institution as flexible as possible. Aid had some other wonderful tools, has some other wonderful tools in development credit. Again, state of the art in its day. But, but our toolbox was, was disparate, that we weren't working together. 
we had tremendous assets overseas in the various forms of the U.S. government, but we weren't talking to each other. One, one commenter in the, uh, in the early days of uh, putting this together said, yeah, we, we have stovepipes of excellence in the U.S. government. <laughs> um, and I thought that was a what, all too uh, telling phrase. Um, so the, the idea of this problem was to recognize how do we get these assets working together as one team. And that, in essence, is what the, is what the Build Act is. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, the, the excitement about this is palpable, and, I, and I've been on this since the very early days working with Jimmy and others. Um, but I will, I will uh, say what both Administrator Mark Green said in an event on the Hill to celebrate the passage, and then the head of OPEC, uh, then number two, said unscripted and just and simultaneously, they had they talked to each other obviously, but they, this wasn't the planned event. Two different events, 48 hours, they said, just imagine we have achieved virtually unanimous bipartisan legislation. Let that sink in for those of us who live in Washington, D.C., beyond, and truly recognize that tremendous uh, achievement thanks to the congressmen and Jimmy and others. And they sent, then followed it with the same phrase. Now the hard work begins. Um, we are building this thing. Um, we want to build on the excitement, et cetera, but it is early days. It is not just a supersized OPEC. It is not just USAID. This new and improved international development finance institution, to quote David Bohegan, this represents a once in a generation chance to think everything anew and to build a, a, the world's preeminent development finance institution to help American businesses and business interests. We are building that together on a daily basis, and that's the exciting part. But it means that each of us and the institutions we represent, the people in this room, we're all going to have to step up our game. Um, the, the, the good news is I've seen the interagency and, 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 and various agencies and departments are, are, are really working hard to step that up. So we'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to do that later. That was great, Carl. Before we pivot to the BUILD Act, I want to um, add to why it matters that America doesn't abandon the field and that we, we stay present around the world. Yes, we want to make money. Absolutely, Dan is right. Yes, we want to keep um, America prosperous, and we want to keep everybody employed here at home. There's another component to this, though. In my experience, and I stand by this, the presence of American companies abroad, their example of working without paying bribes, of hiring and promoting based on merit, of solving some of the most complex problems imaginable, this is a key component of America's soft power. It's what the people we work with overseas look at us and go, gee, those Americans, boy, we sure, that's who we want to make our future with. Thank you for the head nod over there. This is a crucial part of our soft power, and when we can't have our great American companies present, we are losing out on a huge part of what uh, America's, you know, that's where our soft power, our approval rating, the America's influence and America's global leadership, it derives from that presence. So it is about making money. It is about prosperity. It is about jobs. It is also absolutely a pillar of American global leadership. And Congressman Yoho recognized that and then decided that he wasn't going to, you know, clobber for an aid, that this was an important thing. Um, now, we want to talk about the BUILD Act because this is the solution to this problem that we've seen. And it's what will the BUILD Act do to put American businesses back in the game? That's our question here. So let's start with Congressman Yoho. The, the BUILD Act had strong bipartisan support, remarkable. And it offers a new solution with multiple agencies working together to address the problems. Can you just talk about the BUILD Act and tell us why it matters? Well, I think everything you heard right here really matters. Um, I think American leadership, uh, business, rule of law, um, you know, our codes, our ethics, the things that you guys do working with our entities, our business, private entities in the field sets that example. And it just, we hear it over and over again. I, I spoke to ASEAN when I took over the Asia Pacific subcommittee. And ASEAN, as you know, is a group of 10 countries, 653 million people. And I said, what has made ASEAN so successful? They said, because of America's involvement in it, you brought the rule of law, you brought in, you know, um, the, a code of ethics and the honoring of contracts. That's what you guys represent. You guys already know that. And so the BUILD Act is something, like I said, it, we weren't being invited to the table. Now that we're at the table with this new, new uh, uh, vehicle, I want you to understand that our goal is to educate you in the field about the, uh, what the development finance tool that you have because it's a lot of people be skeptical about this. Well, it's just another thing. It's going to be tied up in a bureaucracy. 
it can be if we allow it to be. Our goal is to make sure, and that's one of the things that we've been actively involved, probably outside of the realm of the congressional office, but I didn't read the manual, <laughs> <laughs> is that we want to make sure this thing is implemented the way we intended it to be. Um, Barbara came in and we got talking about we need to have money appropriated for the field so that people understand what this tool is. So we put in requests for funding for AFSA so that the, the field people understand what you have so that you can talk to your, your peers in other countries. <coughs> and then we are, what, uh, we are here to influence the imp implementation. Like I said, it's probably outside of my realm, but we're going to make sure because it's something we've created bipartisanly. And the worst thing we can do is just put it on the shelves and say, well, it's there if you want to use it. We're, we're pushing it, say, you want to use this tool. And, um, you know, if what didn't work in the past, we can get hung up on that, or we can look at the possibilities of the future with this new tool. Be creative. And I think at the last meeting you and I were at, um, I said, it's okay to think outside of the box. What can you do with this that you haven't done before? And be creative talking to the enterprises, you know, because we're bringing in private equity that we haven't been able to do in a form like this. And so that's what we uh, hope to do. That was excellent. I am going to <coughs> I'm gonna switch gears. I'm going to go to Paul first because you were last last time. <laughs> and under the BUILD Act, um, how can you talk about how we're going to get this implemented? And then I'm going to move to Dan and then to Larry. How is it going to make a difference for, for Team USA? Sure. Well, right. uh, but as was mentioned, one of, one of the several of the things that, that were mentioned, equity authority, for the first time ever, the U.S. government joins the ranks of the rest of the development finance institutions and, and is able to do selective choice investments in equity, probably at, at the start with other development partners, et cetera, so that we have a seat at the table. We're often, we're often asked to take a seat right at the front, but then when we talk to our, our like-minded partners and well, we don't do equity. Well, we only have senior jobs. So, so we now have the full range of tools available. At the same time, we've combined some of the tools that, that were complementary from USAID that are going to be with the DFC as well. We're opening up new markets. Uh, the DFC has, uh, will have a, a, a much higher ceiling, a maximum contingent li uh, liability ceiling of $60 billion. Um, so they have all of the markets they, they have, OPEC has worked in before, plus those markets where uh, markets and those transactions where they previously wanted to but didn't have the right tools. Plus, they'll have the, the, all of the, the partners and potential partners that are accessible through USAID missions and other folks who are at COAST. So we'll have all of those coming in. We're going to be building better cooperation, as I said, to, to b break down those stovepipes of excellence. It's not merely cooperation. We're talking about swapping of personnel and setting up systems and procedures whereby every U.S. government asset overseas, whether it's commerce, state, et, et cetera, Knows what this knows about the toolbox is educated in the toolbox. You know, it's talking about ambassadors when they go out, it's 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 swapping it, having State Department officers, commerce officers, etc., doing a full stint at the DFC, and the DFC doing full stints at elsewhere. We need to take advantage of those existing assets in the uh, in the um, overseas overseas markets. We need to do more than just commerce's advocacy, which which is often crucial, as well as ambassadors' advocacy, etc. We need to develop and coordinate better market access. Right now, we have lots of databases created. MCC, when they go into a country, they do a, a, a very, very detailed constraints analysis. We have country strategies with the state and, and everybody under the chief of mission and aid development strategies. The statute explicitly says, you, DFC, will take, take any of these into account, and everything you do will be, will be, will, will be integrated, will be consistent with that. The DFC will be a more closely integrated part of the U.S. government's foreign policy and development uh, uh, apparatus, and thereby gain access to the, 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 those assets overseas. There's some talk about the, the, the additional amount of people. One of the reasons that we supported was that there was a consolidation, <coughs> and we realized that, that whoever you're working for, whichever department, folks overseas are expensive, so we want to maximize the use of existing assets and then supplement where needed. But by building not just exhortations for cooperation, but real systems whereby we cross-train, we, we, cross, uh, um, we, we swap personnel, we'll, it'll be a better integrated whole. That was great. So I want to turn to Dan now to talk from a field perspective and how it comes back up from the field to connect with what Carl has described. So what's in the BUILD Act to benefit American businesses and 
improve the prosperity of the American people back home there. Barbara, thanks. And, and Carl, that is, that is outstanding. And I, I, I think especially looking at maximizing the human capital and the, the appropriations that we already have spent on men and women who are, who are trained up and ready to salute and implement and execute in the field. It really comes down to that, and that is the foreign service in all these countries. If we look at the aspects that we need to do to support this, as Carl pointed, it's, it's all in. It, should, it needs to be a, a, a cultural part of us, you know, embedded in our DNA to do this. I will say this, though. When we look at the mechanics of actually helping companies win, because in the end, there, there needs to be this U.S. component to it, um, there are a lot of mechanics that have to happen on the ground overseas. And the first thing that might start if we walk through this very quickly, and I'm oversimplifying here, is, is simply the identification of an opportunity. So politicians win you know, office and they make all kinds of promises, right? Well, I'm going to build this and this and this and this and this. And maybe 5% <laughs> of those, 5% of those. I'm sorry. No <laughs> I was looking who else was Listen. up here that was elected. <laughs> you know those politicians, right? Like, Thanks, Dan. Like, all I, I, I'm, it's, I'm often told I'm a better engineer than a diplomat. It's really true. So, uh, like I, you know, basically there there are a lot of aspirational you know, projects out there in the developing world. Let's let's focus on the developing world. So it's a hospital project and this and that. And we need to separate the wheat from the chaff. You've got to do that by boots on the ground. Is it realistic that the government of this newly elected government in Uganda is actually going to build a hydroelectric plant? Right, it's a, a simple project like that. And we need to assess that. We assess the viability of that project. Not only the viability of the project as it is, but the viability of the project in terms of US commercial interests, right? So that's the first step, and we need the boots on the ground to do that. The second step is this, getting the message out about the viability of that project to relevant US companies. And Laird really put his finger on this. Uh, the US Commercial Service has a US network of um, 230 people serving in 106 cities, including Jacksonville, uh, serving, serving your district, Congressman, and, and basically, what they do is they work with over 100,000 companies, U.S. companies, 33,000 of which each year are assisted directly with our efforts. So we have the network to get the message out, and we're building out a platform that delivers actionable and relevant sort of market intelligence, you know, leads, if you will. And so that's being worked on as well. And so there's a, a way to get that out. Then when you have U.S. companies interested in it, uh, you actually need those U.S. companies to actually come and look at the project, right? And they do it in two areas. One is they meet with host country government officials and we facilitate these meetings. They find out about viability and they try to influence the requirements up front. Because you never want to go into a tender downstream when the requirements are already cooked to favor some other competitor. So you need to have those meetings. And again, boots on the ground arranging those meetings. But then you need ongoing representation at that local level in Uganda because you can't dial it in from Wichita, Kansas, right? So you have to actually identify trustworthy local representatives. You have to sign them. You have to know that you've got an arbitration clause because the rule of law doesn't work in Uganda, right? If something goes wrong, you need to know they're trustworthy. So those, those uh, trustworthy local reps are people we vet at, out of the embassy and, and we actually uh, contact. Then when the U.S. company says, look, I want to do this, and it costs over a million dollars to bid on some of these plans, right? It's a lot of money and time. Then the formal advocacy, Carl, as you mentioned, kicks in. And last year alone, the, the Advocacy Center facilitated, what, over $73 billion of U.S. wins. This is big, guys. This is mm -hmm. big stuff. And so, so the Advocacy Center out of, of the Commercial Service coordinates the interagency vetting of the U.S. company for reputational risk and also uh, determines the U.S. content. If the company doesn't win, then it becomes a market access issue. Was the whole thing cooked all along? And we go to bat for a market access issue, for a non-tariff barrier, so to speak, and it's usually corruption. If the US company does win, it's not over yet, right? Again, boots on the ground are needed. Take this, this is design, build, operate, folks. We're not design, build, and go home. We're talking about long-standing investment in sustainable economic development in these countries on the infrastructure side. And so when you have AES, for instance, operating a hydroelectric plant, within the scope of the contract, they have, they have clauses that allow them to adjust their tariffs, right? They have uh, unanticipated operating expenses that increase. They need to adjust their tariffs. Well, the host country government in Uganda doesn't like that because it means the population has to pay a higher tariff rate for electricity. So they say, no, you can't do that. Well, that's a violation of the contract. Who goes to bat for that? The Foreign Service on the ground. The Foreign Service on the ground. It's protection of U.S. commercial interests. All of those things need to be done in addition to the financing component that essentially lowers the hurdle for the internal rate of return that a U.S. company needs to show its board of directors in order to proceed with a project.
life cycle of a big deal overseas that gets America back on the ground. There's a lot of obstacles in there. There needs to be rule of law and an enabling framework, and it's the kind of thing that AID and the econ officers are all building. One of the components, though, is this finance issue. And I think one of the things I want Laird to talk about is how big of a deal is that? How big of a deal is the BUILD Act when we think about all the obstacles that an American company faces thinking about going into Africa or elsewhere? Does the BUILD Act actually make a sizable difference? Can you take that on? Sure. So <coughs> at least in my part of the country, if you're going to invite people to a barbecue, it helps to have both steak and beer. And I would argue that the BUILD Act is at least the steak. And so <laughs> for, for a long time, we've been inviting people uh, to come to a barbecue and haven't had a whole lot to offer companies that, that do come. Uh, as uh, So it's great to have the steak. It is not the entire uh, event, so to speak. It's not the, you know, the entire silver bullet you need, but it is an absolutely critical component. So the, I guess the, the why I focus or would focus on the finance element is at the end of the day, uh, certainly for where U.S. companies are, I would speak about Africa, but it's not just in Africa. In a lot of cases, uh, most U.S. companies, the overwhelming majority of U.S. companies don't trade overseas. Those that do trade, uh, something like more than half of the companies, U.S. companies that trade overseas only trade with one or two uh, countries. Uh, most of those happen to be Canada or Mexico. Uh, and so the basic point is that companies know, you know, the, the basically boards end up knowing a few partners in a couple of countries. They know a few banks. Uh, they're very comfortable with a very small vector. A lot of our competitors might have a Rolodex that's ten times that. Uh, and so if you don't know somebody, lack of familiarity tends to uh, translate into perceived risk. Perceived risk in the real world is a finance problem. The higher interest rate is, is more covenants that need to be signed, it's a lot more paperwork, it's longer to close a deal. And you find your Korean, Japanese, French competitor has you know, basically beat you by 30, 60, 90 days to the market. Uh, because these are costs in a lot of case, uh, cases, that also means that maybe you didn't even get to the stage of bidding uh, just because it wasn't feasible. Uh, so it's, it's something where it's really hard uh, effectively just on the, the cost proposition to have American companies be able to compete on anything close to a level playing field. We tend to be a bit more expensive for our products, but the quality tends to be higher. And so we already have a little bit of an uphill, you know, the absence of a lot of U.S. companies in some ways may already have tilted the, the playing field towards, you know, things like standards or market access, et cetera, may already be an uphill climb. So the BUILD Act being here and not just a, a refresh OPIC, but a, if you will, moving from a K car to a Tesla uh, is going to basically allow us to show up in the market in, in, in much more style. The really good thing is I think what I'm anticipating is as DFC gets more, uh, more experience uh, that this will be an iterative learning process. And I think uh, we know from our membership in, in uh, Coca Cancel that the, the enthusiasm from our members is already sky high in terms of, uh, okay, so October 2nd, you know, when can we start talking about some of these new things? Uh, and I think there'll be a, a real sense, I think uh, there'll be a, a number of new worlds that can open up in terms of uh, some of DFC's institutional linkages to some of the bigger financial folks uh, who frankly can start telling us, look, uh, if you could create uh, this kind of uh, funding pipeline. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of things where once we hear more about what the world that we could create, that then allows us to talk to some of these countries about, look, let's, let's rejigger some of these covenants. Let's talk about arbitration. Let's talk about some of these things that might be done. Where frankly, I think uh, you know, the possibility for Team America to be a lot more competitive uh, will, will be far bigger than we can see today. The one other piece I will throw out there uh, is the, the good news is, so Barbara indicated uh, that, that African ambassadors come in and ask, where are the U.S. companies? This isn't a, uh, it's not pejorative, it's not a complaint, it actually really is a real plea, and I know it, it happens elsewhere as well. But the other piece of it is uh, Africa itself is moving very quickly. So the little notice in Washington is uh, that Within two years, the African countries, African Union members, have moved very quickly to, to ratify uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, 
The amazing thing is they will, they're two countries short of bringing this into effect. Uh, they haven't yet quite drafted all the pieces. They're only getting to things like services to dispute settlements, et cetera. But this is something that's up and running very quickly. Uh, CCA uh, works with the U.S. mission to the AU uh, on the margins of this year's African Union Heads of State Summit. And we brought U.S. companies uh, to meet with uh, African leaders to actually talk about as you get to services, as you get to some of these future uh, sectors, here are the kinds of things U.S. companies are interested in. And so we've started this dialogue, but there is this real, very well-meaning uh, <coughs> African governments, African companies want to see more input from U.S. companies. They want to see more. How do, how do we develop really these leading sectors and the things where U.S. companies have great strength, the knowledge economy, ICT, advanced manufacturing, even some infrastructure projects. Uh, so this is the kind of thing, the opportunities are huge. I totally agree with Dan on the, it, it does take uh, boots on the ground, uh, you know, folks who can actually go out and have iterative cups of coffee meet with people to develop these things. You know, figuring out how to, what Africa's ICT environment uh, needs to be is not a two-week process. Uh, this is something that, that needs to be longer term. Uh, and certainly having some other things, so more boots on the ground would help. It would be great if there was a, a reauthorized, stronger XM, things like that. But the BUILD Act itself at least uh, really puts America a lot, a lot more back in the game and is a great place to build on. So that's great. We've got um, the steak at the barbecue. That's the Build Act. Um, I love that, the idea that you at least need to offer people something when you invite them over. So we've talked today about this rising great power competition, and it's that you know we're just not um, – we're not winning uh, currently, and we want to. to it matters that we stay on the field and we stay present with our with our great American companies. In the Build Act, we've talked about some of the the ways that it will actually give us a powerful new tool. I want to ask um, Congressman Yoho for final comments before we open this up to questions from you. So get your questions ready, and Congressman Yoho, some final words of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> well. I think the biggest thing is you guys have a tool in your hand. <laughs> Utilize it and, um, you know, offer it. We were in uh, Laos, and uh, a business person came up to me, and they are working on an energy project with transmission lines from the hydroelectric dam selling electricity to uh, Vietnam. And um, we talked about OPEC, and he says, OPEC's worthless for me. He goes, I've got to put all my money up front. If I don't get the bid, I've lost that. And I was telling him about the BUILD Act and what it would do, and he's become a regular visitor because he didn't think it was going to happen. A lot of people didn't think it was going to happen. And, uh, you know, when you can show them that we have changed, it's a new day in American government, we are going to be competitive, we are going to be there. And as Barbara brought up, the rising power that we've seen, we haven't seen since World War II, there's a tectonic shift in world powers. This is something that we have to have to be competitive um, with a rising China. And the goal wasn't exactly to counter them, but I'm sure happy it is. And uh, you guys probably know the buzz better than I do. I know before it was passed, we were in Hawaii with Admiral Harry Harris. He was talking about the Build Act. Um, we've been in Japan, South Korea, Vietnam. Uh, Ed Royce called me up and he goes, wherever I go, they're talking about the Build Act. Mike Pompeo the other day, I had the good fortune of traveling with him. And he'd just gotten back from somewhere, and they were talking about the Build Act. So the buzz is out there. The important thing for you is to know that it's real, and we're going to do everything we can on a bipartisan way to make sure that this tool is in the forefront of diplomacy as you go forward. And to have, to have you have the confidence that we're going to stand behind this. We're going to make sure the appropriations are there. Uh, we're talking to the administration all the time in OMB, and so... Um, I'm excited for you about the possibilities of the future of how you can change development and our relationship with these countries. So thank you. That was pretty inspirational. Let's have a round of applause. Yes, thank you. So, Alan, am I correct that people need to – am I correct that we need to – People actually go to that mic? Okay. So there we are, the shy – Come on up to the mic, ask your question, and if you're directing it to a specific panelist, just go ahead and do so. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Rafi Bayan. I'm an FSO on detail at Treasury right now. 
Uh, two questions. The first, uh, first, thank you very much for the panel, and thank you, Congressman, for your leadership on this very critical issue for our foreign uh, policy. Sure. The second question is related to the Ukrainian retaliation. Uh, we did a fantastic job in, in, in the OECD to basically uh, put the end to the current regime and our strategic and policy goals in terms of revising the regime to deal with the economic crisis. So that's been a very critical effort for us. Uh, the second question is related to the ally of the Ukrainian regime. And an example, I think, of how rapid the government was in terms of our threat to power. Sixty-seven percent of those contracts were awarded to American companies. Um, how do we how do we address this issue when uh, our European Let me answer that first part of that. Um, God, what was the first part of that? Oh, the review, <laughs> the administration. Implementing regulations. The administration, they had a 120-day period of time that they had to come out with that reports out. And um, James Walsh is back here. He may have to answer some of these for me. Um, so we want to make sure that the report is out, that we can go on to the next phase to implement that and to make sure that they follow through with that. And that's something, like I said, we're, we've got our hands on this. And uh, I know these other agencies aren't used to having congressional offices do that, but until I'm told not to, we would still probably do it. Um, but we want to make sure that they are accountable, that they follow through, that they put the right people in place at the right time so that October 1st of 2019, we're still looking at the rollout of this. And uh, that's our goal. As far as the tide aid, um, we can defer here, but that's something that I think by bringing in uh, private equity, I think you're going to see a whole different dynamics than we've seen in the past, and that was one of the goals with this. Is any Carl, you want to weigh well, in on that? Well, a couple of things. First, uh, the, you know, the Build Act gives us an increased set of tools. We talked a little bit about um, some of the things that were different. One of them is OPEC's requirement is a U.S. nexus. Uh, over years, that's 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 come out to be a, a somewhat rigid sort of barrier, of, uh, threshold of 20 to 25 percent for a particular deal. Under the Build Act, there's a a, a preference, which is a a, a more flexible tool. Um, we we found OPIC was doing an increasingly good job with clever lawyers of, of finding that nexus, et cetera, to do the deals, but they were still precluded from some because because there was a, a ri rigid tie. With preference, we still want to push for American firms and American business interests, but it, it, it will enable the new DFC to look at the mix, to get the intel from the a assets on the ground, for example, and then get the right combination of folks. We're going to be, so on the one hand, increasingly encouraging American firms to, and uh, highlighting the opportunities, bringing a better set of tools to mitigate the risk to help them come in, and at the same time also being able to work together in combinations on transactions more flexibly. But more importantly, th this goes to a different model, which moves away from thinking it as just overseas development assistance, official aid. And, and uh, the USAID administrator talks about the, the, the a country's journey to self-reliance and, and increasing private sector engagement. Uh, other parts of the US government may, may not use those phrases, but it recognizes the, 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 the difference in our model, the superior model. Yes, our strategic competitors can bring lots of state aid and, and sort of loan to own, et cetera. At the end of the day, it's not official development assistance from the American taxpayer or our allies that's going to do it. It's the essentially infinite amount of private sector capital that's going to go in there and make the investments. Our administrator in aid says, our job is to work ourselves out of a job in the, in the, in the development assistance. And what's going to happen at the end? There's going to be a vibrant private sector, American businesses, American investors, 
together with our, our, our counterparts in, in uh, um, developing countries, in the emerging markets, which are the great fit. That's what's going to be left behind. That's ultimately more sustainable. That's why people are knocking at our doors, because they recognize that. They want that. So if, so if we use these flexible tools correctly and smartly, we're going to marry up private, uh, private American investors with local investors, which are stronger. And that's not tied aid. That's just a, uh, that's a, a better functioning market. That gets away from that whole paradigm. I, ju I just want to I, I want to offer a concrete example because I think there's a there's a there's an argument to be made for U.S. company national interest being being involved and without the linkage. And just to give you a certain example, in Panama we worked very closely with the U.S. mining company, uh, copper mining company. And what that U.S. copper mining company did was it was adhering to environmental and social impact. Right, it really was doing its due diligence, but it also did something very significant that I find striking. In Panama, they needed certified welders. And instead of importing an army of people from, uh, let's say, China, which is frequently the case, is sort of this, this, is a, this is a clause that you have to meet. We're going to bring in the entire workforce and do it. They were taking pains to bring in trainers and also talking with us about a consular affairs uh, so that they could train Panamanians to become certified welders based uh, up to U.S. standards. That's investment that U.S. company does in workforce capacity sustainable economic development of the country. Now, if you are the, the minister of energy in Uganda and you're concerned about the, the your population, your workforce, which sounds more appealing? Which sounds more appealing? Thank you. Let me take the next question, please. Well, Congressman, I'd like to thank you for an excellent initiative. This is the best thing I've seen come along in a long time. And uh, I'm an engineer in the Foreign Service. Prior to that, for 15 years, I worked with GRU, worked with AES, worked with Duke Energy. We designed, built, operated power plants around the world. But um, one of the things I think I heard was the tools aren't all there yet. And as you're building this thing while you're flying it, one of the things I think American engineers are known for, as well as our private sector, is good design. We build things well, we build things safe, we build things reliable, built on well-known international standards. And it's tough for a private company to fly in and fly out with engineering on the quick. So where is the core competency of engineering and technical know-how going to sit in this thing? Because for a private company to do good design, it takes boots on the ground. Jimmy, you want to come up to the microphone and explain that? As far as the engineering, how we put the money in there? Dan wants to weigh in on that. Sorry. Yeah, I, I've got one concrete example. I love concrete examples, right? So uh, when, when I was in Panama serving Barbara, uh, we had uh, the Panama Canal expansion, right? Panama Canal Authority used to be a federal agency, great at running and operating a Panama Canal. It's a different thing to build, right? That's a project, not a program uh, from an engineering context. But we didn't try to develop, nor did Panama Canal Authority develop the in-house capacity, the engineering expertise needed. Instead, we got them in touch with CH2M Hill, and CH2M Hill was the project management oversight for them. This is the bottom line. You don't want, and I know this will appeal to you, Congressman, <laughs> um, you don't want to ask government to build all this core competence that you mentioned is necessary. We're a private sector economy. We've got those skill sets in the private sector. We want to provide a convening authority, a forum, where we identify those opportunities and we bring in the best, the best engineers from the private sector. That's what we do. And I think that goes back to the basic question that you asked is the private um, sector expertise is really what's coming on board here. And they can have, you know, partner up with us too. And we can partner up with that country, company. I'm going to say one more thing because I'm such a CH2M Hill fan, Denver based, employee owned, 
it's been bought recently, so I don't even have to ask them permission to say these anymore because they don't exist. But they were um, also in charge of the consortium that built the Olympic Village in East London, which came in under budget, ahead of schedule, with 98% landfill avoidance, one of the best safety records that ever been produced, safer that building site than most offices in the United Kingdom. Um, and what it had did to clean up a brownfield polluted site and make it rushing with water and teeming with birds was amazing. You want to talk about soft power? You talk about how an American company can come in and run a project this way and deliver these kind of results. Folks, that's soft power. Please, next question. I can, I can speak only briefly, so uh, because although I know USAID has supported Asha for a long, long time, um, I don't have the details of the program, but we can talk offline. Uh, a couple of things. The, n the new DFC will have grant authority as well, um, but the idea of the DFC is not to replicate existing things, rather, but it's to use a better set of development finance tools as a sort of one-stop shop for the rest of the U.S. government. Right now, aid missions have access to our the development credit pools, and development guarantees, et cetera, of the Development Credit Authority under the, under the as of October 1, we'll, all of our missions and operating units or, and other U.S. government agencies as well will be able to bring their budgets, their money to the table and say, DFC, we have something, we have a mandate that Congress has given us to accomplish, and we want to use those tools and we can help, we can help, help pay for it. And so that we're going to be doing that so that will be, if the, the right solutions to your particular set of challenges, and I, I don't know enough to speak that specifically, involve development finance tools, then we'll be knocking at the, at the, uh, the DFC's door, where, where we will have access at least as fast, and we're working on some details about that faster, um, to support those things. So, so in that sense, that's where the DFC comes in. Um, aid, by the by, is also really thinking about how we work better, and our economists are debating how we, how we better groom the workforces of, uh, of tomorrow. Uh, abroad. So let's have a conversation offline after this. I'll be glad to, to talk to some more details. Okay. I think that's good. Let's go to the next question.
interject there because what you guys do, I'm blown away with. We see it over and over again when I travel to a different country. The, the State Department's there. They have that, as you said, the first name basis with all these different companies. They come in, and then we hear from the companies when they come to the States or we're over there, what a great job and how valuable what you do for that country and for that company and for the trade that they're developing. So I appreciate what you do, Linda. Thank you, Linda. It's 915, and I'm going to actually wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Con We're at 915. I promised you 915. We did not get the last couple questions, but um, thank you. You were a terrific audience. And I don't think we're going to end on a higher note than your thanks for being in awe of the work that we do. And we are so grateful to you, uh, Congressman Yoho, for the leadership that you've shown to get America back in the game with a powerful new tool. Can we have a closing round of applause here?